Hello folks, this is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 17 of Arrow 4080. Today we're going to be studying grid frames, which is the word that uh, Logan uses for beams with torsional effects. Unfortunately, he, in order to include torsion, he's going to drop axial load capability. But we'll restore that in our next lecture on this and two lectures in this class. Okay, let's see how it works. All right, so first uh, we can remind ourselves of the beam element and how we for, for, uh, formulated that. We defined it as a member that has transverse stiffness. We defined this coordinate system and we're looking at our translation and rotational in terms of bending degrees of freedom, which was driven by our moments and our forces. Okay? We use this stiffness matrix for our uh, for our beam and that gives us a relation of translating our displacements into forces given down here okay this is a couple lectures ago we learned this next we added axial capability we looked at the stiffness matrix for an axial member and the stiffness matrix for a beam member and then we combined them to come up with a single stiffness matrix to deal with both we called that a two-dimensional frame element and that gave these relations here where here's our global stiffness matrix typically what we'll do is use the local multiplied using this relation for our transformation okay now before we move into switching out the axial load stiffness and the, uh, and the torsional stiffness, it behooves us to remember what we've already learned. Whenever we have a round section in torsion, whether it's hollow or solid, we have stresses defined by Tc over J and uh, rotations defined by Tl, uh, Tl over Gj. Now if Actually, we can kind of cut to the chase on where we're headed by just looking at this. This is analogous to, remember we saw for axial load, we saw our stiffness is PL over AE, or excuse me, our deflection. Our stiffness is just the force over deflection. Therefore, our force divided by PL over AE, these P's cancel, and we got AE over L. That is the stiffness relation for an axial load. In the same way, if we wanted to find the same thing for torsion, this is axial load, then we would take our deflection, TL over GJ. We know that the stiffness is just K, uh, torque over displacement, rotational displacement. That means it's the torque over the TL over GJ, and our torques cancel, which gives us GJ over. L, right? So we see that these stiffness relations are analogous of torsion to, to axial load. Now with that said, we're going to go ahead and define this slightly more rigorously. Before we do that, let's refresh our memory on what happens if we have a non-circular section. For those, uh, remember for a tor for a circular section, our, our uh, torsional constant J happens to be our polar moment of inertia given by these two formulas. If we have a non-circular section, we have almost the same form of the equation. We have TT over J for our stresses and TL over GJ for our rotations. And in this case, our torsional constant may be different that resists torsional stress versus what resists torsional rotation. Our torsional constants are simply the summation of the alpha bt cubes or the beta bt cubes and those can be calculated this way and you've got a little table in your handbook okay now coming back to what we're trying to add to our repertoire today is this idea of these beams these grid frames that logan calls them beams with torsional capability this is one example if you have a flat structure you got forces attached that may rotate your beams cause rotation, then this grid frame is appropriate. Our degrees of freedom are still the translational and the rotational for bending, but now we also have a torsional rotation. We don't have any axial capability because we're moving it for this formulation. We'll put that back in later. 
okay? And that means we're gonna get torsional, uh, we're gonna get transfer sources, we will get bending moments and torsional moments. In this particular case, since we're defining our X coordinate along the beam axis, then the moment uh, X is the torsional moment and that moment about the Z is the rotational moment, okay? With that said, uh, and taking a closer look at the rotational component, we notice that our beam may be rotating, both nodes may be rotating, but what's pertinent to this beam is the difference in rotation between end one and end two. So if we know what the rotation is at the first end, we can subtract that from what's at the other end to find out how much this is rotating, this element is rotating, if any, okay? So going back to our 3261 where we first introduced shear stresses uh, for torsion, we saw that the shear strain was defined along the length of it as the angle of that twist going along the length of the member that's rotating. And if you look at the end of it, you see the angle of twist. In this case, that's phi. So we have gamma is our longitudinal uh, rotation of an element. And that's our shear strain. And our phi is the axial looking rotation of the element, and that's our angle of twist. We can calculate this arc AB. It's related to both the shear strain, gamma dx, or dx is just the length of the total element, and once again, this is all for a moment acting actually a torque on this thing, and that is related, it's gonna be the same value as the R d phi, where phi is just that angle of rotation. You can now substitute that, and this is just reminding us that that shear strain then is just related to that difference in rotation between the two nodes, okay? With that said, we then can write the stiffness matrix, and this is an, uh, pretty intuitive, as we saw a couple slides ago where I sketched that out, where this equation comes from. We have a moment at each end, which is, uh, this moment is actually a special moment, it's a torque, and we have a rotation at each end, and those rotations, those torsional rotations are related to the torsional moments through this GL over, uh, GL over J constant. So that gives us our local stiffness matrix. With that said, we can now combine that with the bending stiffness of the beam, like we did with, tor with the axial load before, to get this total stiffness matrix, local stiffness matrix for an element of this kind. Okay? That means if we uh, this is our local stiffness matrix. It's global if it's aligned with a global axis, and we can translate it with uh, into transform it for any kind of rotation using this two-dimensional transform here. Okay. With that said, we're now ready to develop our method. We've got our stiffness relation for torsion and our stiffness relation for bending. We've already seen the bending one and the torsional one is very similar to our axial load. We combine these two in the same way we did for axial load and we get this equation here where we have these constants C3, J, and C2. We then uh, can develop our local stiffness matrix is can be written this way. Same thing is up as in here in this relation where we're equating our forces and moments to our deflections and angles of twist. And then we can have now, we define this transformation matrix. We're gonna call this a TB2D. For a torsional beam, two-dimensional torsional beam, this is my own nomenclature because I didn't really like the beam's nomenclature or uh, the book's nomenclature. So we have a the transformation for a torsional beam in 2D, and we can, once we've solved our system of equations, we can convert our local stiffness matrix to our global stiffness matrix with this relation, and everything else is calculated in the same way as before. Therefore, we can summarize our method, and this is starting to get to be old hat, because we're doing it kind of the same way. We're modeling our nodes and elements. We define our stiffness matrix for each and every element, but now it has both torsional and bending stiffness. We define our transformation matrix or calculate it for each and every element, and then we can transform our 
local stiffness matrix into a global one and assemble our global stiffness matrix. We then reduce our system with our boundary conditions, solve for displacements, use the displacements to get the external forces, use the external uh, the displacements again, the ones corresponding with each element to calculate the global forces in each element, which we can then transform uh, into the local values like this. And that's all there is to it. And you'll notice I have the timing off on this one little equation on the left. Okay, let's take a look at an example. So let's say we have a grid frame like this. You'll notice we've got, what, one, two, three, four nodes. We've got three grid frame elements and we've got an axial load. You'll see this, or excuse me, a transverse load. This transverse load loads these up in bending. And it also has the possibility of introducing torsion. You'll notice like element one, since we have the element one is going like this from node two to node one, and this force here is causing it to deflect. Now normally that would just be a cantilever beam, but it's attached to this other thing. That means as it deflects, it's gonna be rotating that beam like this. And element three will be rotating. Element two looks like it'll be mostly just bending. This formulation will allow us to get this. Now we, we didn't put in the axial stiffness. When you deflect this, you also could get some axial displacement, but we're not gonna see any of that because we don't have that in our stiffness matrix, okay? So we're gonna start out, I like to echo my inputs. Right, these are all our properties, and we can echo, these are where our nodes are located, and this is how the grid points are attached with the properties that are going in and the direction cosines for those. We then can go and construct our local stiffness matrix for each and every element, and our transformation matrix for each and every element. Here is the transformation matrix, this is the equation, and these are the three transformation matrices. And this is our equation for local stiffness and the transformation from local to global. And if you construct the local stiffness matrix, then multiply by this transformation, you get these values. Okay, now we're ready to construct our global stiffness matrix in the same manner as before. The easiest way is to construct a matrix with the transverse and rotational displacements for each and every node and then assemble which terms go where for each node. That gives us a global matrix like this. Now you'll notice our next step is to reduce our system of equations. We see that nodes two, three, and four are fixed, which blows all of those terms straight to hell. And it doesn't affect our analysis. In fact, it just simplifies our analysis so we can calculate this. Now we have a reduced system of equation it looks like all we're going to get out of this is a transverse displacement, a torsional displacement, and a rotation for node 1. And remember that rotation is uh, going to be in global coordinates, and then we're going to turn that back into the beam coordinates. Okay, so here we go. We solve that system, and we get our, tra our displacement, our torque, uh, torsional displacement or rotation and our oh and that is a typo that second one term should be units of radians so we've got inches radians and radians right we've got the torsional rotation that's our phi x and we've got the uh, bending rotation which is our phi z your textbook has a typo because they interchanged a couple digits is just to warn you about that we then can calculate our external forces by just multiplying all of our global displacements back against our global stiffness matrix. And then we can go and select each of the displacements for each and every node, for each and every element, and then solve for our uh, local or our global forces in each element and then transform those into local forces for each element. And that gives us these set of local forces and moments for each element. Once again, Fy is the transverse shear for each of these. Mx is a torque and Mz is a moment using the sign convention we showed earlier. On this slide, we will plot out what those results are. Let's start out with member one. So if we take member one, we see here's member one. It's shown right here, right? This is member one, and we're going to draw it down here. 
and we're going to be using these forces on member one. And if you take first, you see that we have Fy at node one. So at node one, we have 19.12. It's in the negative direction. Since our x is going along the, act, the beam from uh, 1 to 2, and our y is defined upwards, right? x going into y means positive z going that direction. That means our positive y is up, so that means this force is acting downward as shown here. Okay. Then we come to our torque, and we look at positive torque will be aligned along the beam like this. Since that value is negative, it's going the other direction which we're showing right here. We then have the moment in the Z. Since the Z is acting in that direction, a moment, positive moment, will be going this way. But since we have a negative value, that means it's going like this, causing compression on the upper surface. Then for the next node, we see we have positive 19, which means it's in the positive direction for the shear. We have a positive torque, which means it's in the positive direction uh, acting along the beam, and we have a negative moment, which means it's also acting in the negative direction, which is now causing, uh, that is going to be causing compression on the bottom, as you can see that. See that? Okay. We then can plot out our other elements in the same way. Here's element two, element three. That's how it works, and that's how we would draw an exploded free body diagram of each. Now, the difference with an exploded free body diagram, if we, this is just a free body diagram of each and every element. If we want an exploded free body diagram, we would have put node 3, we would have put node 1, we would have put node 4, and we would have put node 2. We would have then drawn a smaller element 2, a smaller element 1, and a smaller element 3. Excuse me, this is 1, and this is 3. We then would have laid out our forces and moments. This is 1, that means we would have put this 19.2, 2, 4, 8, oh, Kayla inches, and this could be shown like this, actually, 167 point K. And inch kips, kill inches, that's a silly way to do it. And then on the other end, that's going to be going up. This is going to be going like this. And this is going to be going like this. You see how that works? And then we do it for all the others as well. We'd also do draw the nodes. So the nodes are going to see the equal and opposite. And we would also be seeing, you'd also see the external forces, which we would grab from our F vector and put those on here too. Okay? That's how grid frames work. Now, next lecture, we're going to go back to Nastran. Then we come back, we're going to put torque as well as axial load and bending. Enjoy.